Hello everyone and welcome to Magma Rages episode 74. Uh, I'm here and I'm joined by Pandemonia as always. Welcome, welcome, welcome Pandemonia. Uh, so we've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, we, we, our, the main focus of this episode was going to be on the nerfs, but then we got the announcement uh, late yesterday about uh, some buffs that are actually coming to Hearthstone. Uh, rather surprisingly so we're kind of kind of going to take this in order of uh, their release talk about the nerfs first and then the the buffs but which are you more excited for pandemonia the nerfs or the buffs i'm more excited for the buffs because i mean pure pure numbers wise sure uh also for me it was more also the the so the surprise the surprise factor yeah i mean like everybody i mean we were all specul. i mean nearly everyone was expecting the nerfs, right? Yeah. In some form or another. Like, you know, people, you know, whether it was uh, all the cards or some of the cards, most people kind of got the nerfs right. But it's the balance update where uh, Blizzard just announced uh, some nerfs and, oh, hi guys, by the way, next month we're buffing 18 cards and we're adding a new card. Which, yeah. like, which I, is I huge and, and, and unprecedented in Hearthstone. I mean, that's exactly. the big key thing there, right? It's the first time they're doing. And also, it's the first time they added a new card mid expansion. Yeah, which I think is also quite cool. Yeah, I mean we've we like we've seen that a little bit with Zale. They got added with Dalar and Heist, but that's not really a card that has much of an impact on standard. Whereas um, Snip Snap, that we'll be talking about a bit later, uh, is definitely a, a different kettle of fish there. Okay, but first of all, uh, let's get to the nerfs. So. Let's have a look at the first card that they are that actually the nerfs have just gone live like a little bit before this recording so i played maybe one or two games of uh rogue um and so we'll kind of contextualize that but that's a little bit too much of a small sample size to say too much about these cards uh and the first one is evil miscreants getting a nerf uh going uh from a 1.5 to a 1.4 so where do you think this leaves evil miscreant overall you think it's still playable so, <laughs> my feeling on the miscreant nerf is it feels a, like a fair, a fair nerf, and in in a vacuum, if if that was the only card to be nerfed, like like because we're going to talk obviously about the other nerfs, but if yeah. the other two cards from Rogue weren't going to be nerfed, I think Evil Miscreant would still be very powerful and would still see play in basically the exact same deck. But yeah. In terms of like context, with with the other nerfs we're going to talk about. It then obviously it leaves the entire art like the entire deck it currently sees playing. It leaves that sort of up in the air. Yeah, I mean, I think Evil Miscreant is still pretty powerful. I mean, when we spoke yeah. uh, in one of the previous Magma Rages episodes, we talked about possible nerf ideas and we talked about nerfing Miscreant to a one three. I think that would have definitely brought down its power level a lot more. I think right now, like its power levels, maybe only gone down like twenty percent. Uh, you know, so I think just bringing it in line with kind of most of the other cards in, in Rogue and cards from Rise of the Shadows, I think it'll still be a good card because Lackeys are actually still just really powerful. And whilst it makes a big difference, 5 health to 4 health, because of a lot of uh, breakpoints that Evil Miscreant's not going to survive now, um, you know, everything from like Eviscerate, Vendetta, uh, even Wagglepick in like the Mirrors, to like, you know, Flame Strikes and True Silver Champions, there's a lot of stuff that deals 4 damage, uh, but a lot less that deals five, so that's quite a big break point. So I think that that's that's very important to note that miscreants are going to die a lot more now before they get shadow stepped. So that means a lot less lackeys, and the lackeys are obviously where the power is here. So I think that you know the fact they've kept it that it's still two lackeys seems pretty good, and I think overall miscreant still seems like the best lackey generation for rogue, um, and probably one of the best lackey generators you know in the game and and lackeys are pretty good so i think that leaves evil miscreant still in a, in a fairly good place uh next up we have raiding party uh so raiding party has gone up from three mana to four mana uh so you know wh what do you think of of this so <clears throat> this even though like sure you know it's, it's one mana for me what makes this really so stand out in terms of makes it a lot worse is you can no longer like do stuff like prep it on three. Okay, obviously about the other nerf and then like waggle pick on four. 
Yeah. Like, because that, that was, I think, part of what made the Tempo Rogue really powerful was your, your turn three consisted of usually things like prep, uh, prep rain party into turn four waggle pick Dread Corsair or Dread Corsairs. Yeah, or even when you that were just like <laughs> backstabbing and playing raiding party, you know? Like, whatever you were using, even if it was coining raiding party on two, like, you could set up the raiding party into the waggle pick curve and now that's very different because raiding party has shifted to four so that makes a huge difference as you mentioned we'll, we'll kind of get to the preparation nerf after this but um i mean i think just this nerf to raiding party is is pretty substantial uh i think you know the reasoning they gave for this was along the lines of um cards that draw specific cards you know what we often refer to as kind of tutors uh are a lot more powerful than just like a card that draws the equivalent amount of uh, random cards from your deck, right? So uh, they, they're kind of wanting to bring it in line with that. And I think Raiding Party still might be one of the best draw engines for Rogue, quite frankly. Um, having tried to build a Rogue deck now with with uh, trying to figure out what the rest of the draw kind of engines are on the deck, Raiding Party might still be up there, but it significantly lowers the power level of the package with Waggle Pick and the Dread Corsairs. So I think we're going to see people shift away from Raiding Party to start off with at least. Um, and then maybe later when we can find some specific uses for it, it might see some play. Um, but I think it's it's a very big uh, nerf to Raiding Party compared to like the Miscreant one that we saw. Yeah, and I think this kind of also goes a bit hand in hand with like the next nerf yeah um preparation so preparation uh this nerf made me pretty sad when i scrolled down and and saw the preparation was getting nerf i kind of like shouted out because a lot of the like things i've seen people suggest for preparation nerfs are like quite scary um but this case we've got a a more sensible nerf i would say preparation is no longer reducing the next spell you cast uh by three it's reducing it by two instead so more in line with like old innovate um a, a lot of the spells you were prepping uh for free uh you know that would result in zero mana cost at least were um two mana spells anyway sap and eviscerate being the two main key ones so it still works pretty well with those in combination with stuff like gadgets and auctioneer um but it's a lot less powerful with the more expensive spells like myra's unstable element sprint uh and obviously the raiding party now is that's gone up in cost as well so i mean where do you think this leaves prep overall oh like i think in you know miracle rogue decks like if, if miracle rogue makes a return it could still see play because like you, it, you like you said it still reduces eviscerate sap uh should have even uh now it kind of the, the sort of the interesting ones are the three cost spells rogue uh, uh, the three cost rogue spells that remain whether now are you prepared to play one mana for them so like for example fan of knives uh yeah, yeah. and now uh, while well, well, not no longer raiding party what other three mana spells are there uh well there's a uh, violet haze until uh, that gets the buff that we'll be talking about <laughs> um and then there's uh th a three mana there's not a lot, but there's a lot more like if you go above that, like the Waggle Pick at four, uh, Assassinates at five. Um, not that really Assassinate was played very much. Or wa wa um, the Walk the Plank was, sorry, uh, not Waggle Pick, the Walk the Plank, yeah. Uh, walk the Plank was played uh, in some of the, the sideboards, so it has kind of a impact on that as well. Um, and then, of course, Vendetta, like if you don't have the Activator, uh, then sure, it, it yeah. also matters. So yeah, I mean, I think the biggest impact this card has, if I had to pick like what, because the question is, prep is something that facilitated other things in Rogue, right? And the question you have to ask yourself is, what are the biggest cards that, that this change impacts? Uh, and other than Raiding Party, which was getting its own nerf as well, I think the biggest cards that impacts are Sprint and um, Fan of Knives. Uh, those are kind of... The most two commonly used ones. I mean, now if we're prepping out a sprint, that's five mana to draw four mm -hmm. cards. That doesn't feel anywhere near as good. So we're left with Gadgets and Auctioneer as more of a, um, more of our main kind of uh, draw engine. And then I think we, we, you know, with Fan of Knives, one mana to deal one damage to all things 
is is not that good because you kind of eliminate the draw a card aspect in a way because you are having to spend a card in preparation to get that reduction mm. so yeah um i i think prep may still be playable but honestly i had a little bit of uh struggle putting in my deck but because rogue needs ways to activate combos i think you know, prep with those other two mana spells might still be viable enough in a lot of rogue decks. Um, okay, and then we can move on to the final nerf. So this is uh, Archivist Deliciana. Archivist, Archivist Deliciana is going from uh, eight mana up to nine. Uh, this is mostly to cut out the kind of recursions that you could do with Archivist Deliciana with the like Baleful Bankers and um, Youthful Brewmasters. So mostly to reduce those kind of excruciatingly long warrior mirrors that we saw in the the masters qualifiers. Yeah. So like like you said, the the first three rogue nerfs are more because of the popularity and the power level of rogue, whereas this nerf is almost more like I don't think it's sort of an overpowered issue, more just like quality a, of life. Qu- quality well, quality of life and like make it a, a more fun experience, right? Because you know. Playing like a bazillion arch- uh, archivist Silicianas, I don't think it's fun for anyone. It's I, like I actually emotions. don't think it's that unfun for the people playing that game. It's unfun for everyone waiting for them in a Masters qualifier, <laughs> or unfun for the viewers watching uh, like this repeatedly in Grand Masters, right? Sure. So yeah, yeah I think I mean the archivist Siliciana nerf very much more affecting Control Warrior mostly. Uh, mm. I queued into a Masters Qualifier earlier today and my opponent was playing Control Warrior and they had Archivist Elysian in their deck. And this was the one that started at 6 p.m. our time, which is about an hour before we expected the nerfs to go live. So they were knowingly putting Elysian in their deck, knowing that the nerfs would go live. They had no recursion or anything in like the, the sideboards. So, uh, so you know, it might... Yeah, so, so like maybe it's still viable in Control Warrior, but you, you can't just guaranteed out fatigue everything except other control warriors right um yeah and then there's there was a whole discussion around the fact that it's still nine mana means that like if you're in a mirror if you're on the coin it uh, is still but then the question comes down to is it worth still running elisiana and let's say a youthful brewmaster or baleful banker on the off chance that you play a mirror and then you hope to hire all with the coin. Like, I mean, that, it like, might be, right? Because worse? like Youthful Brewmaster in particular is not that bad of a card if you consider it in like uh, Control Warrior. I mean, there are other targets for you to bounce. Like there's, you know, Zilliax, there's um, uh, Omega Devastator, probably most Im- Im- impactfully. So it's not that bad. And if they can't kill your Elysiana when you play it, you can still bounce it as well. So... I think it's not entirely unreasonable that we see some sideboards that actually just bring in like one banker if you're playing like Elysian on your main board. But there are other decks as well now that can maybe make better use of Elysiana than Control Warrior, right? And we're talking about like Shadowwalk Shamans. Um, and, and even Rogue, right? If yeah. that ever becomes a thing, right? Yeah, because you can still Shadow Step it. Um, and, and Dare Escape it. Yeah, and Daring Escape. And Togwag or Scheme, but if you're Togwag or Scheming it, like, you, it's going to last a long time. Like, you've... Rogue has so many other ways to put cards in their deck that I don't think it matters. Like... Also, Control Rogue is not exactly... Yeah. Like a, yeah. It's not exactly a thing. So, like, most of the time, you're just going to rather play Academic Espionage and Togwag or Scheme if you want to shuffle a bunch of cards into your deck, or right? Tech. Right, all the tack stuff. Well, but tack is not shuffling it into your deck. Tack is just. But I'm saying in combination, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and, and uh, so I don't think it's it's not really much of a, a relevance in rogue. Mostly in in shaman, uh, where we see it be be relevant. I think. Um, so yeah, archivist Deliciana, I think this is a good quality of life nerf. I wouldn't have minded seeing it go to ten mana. Um, but, you know, just to avoid those weird coin shenanigans. Because it's going to be weird if they have to nerf it again, right? To, to 10 mana uh, after yeah. this. So, yeah. I feel like they maybe should have just nerfed 10 mana for one time and that's it. Yeah, I mean, usually with nerfs, we talk about, like, not going overboard. You don't have to kill the card. And, like, usually we get upset when they do. But, like, Archivist Deliciana was a card I didn't mind them killing. You know, if this was Game of Thrones, I'd be happy if she died in Season 3. <laughs> Um, but yeah, okay. 
Uh, next up, we have the, the buffs to talk about. And this is some very exciting news. So the concept with these buffs was um, Rise of the Mech. Uh, not Rise of the Mechs, Rise of the Mech, uh, which is still a weird title to me. Um, but the, the, the story goes here that uh, Dr. Boom, or they've said Blastmaster Boom, has gone back to his um, drawing board and buffed uh, n uh, two cards from each class from uh, Boomsday Project and also added one extra card, uh, Snip Snap, which uh, we can have a look at here. And this is also going to be a Boomsday Project card, which means it's going to rotate right when Boomsday Project does, uh, but you won't be getting it in your Boomsday Project packs. You will be getting it for free, though. Uh, so tell us a little bit about Snip Snap here, Pandemonia. So Snip Snap is kind of a... It's a 3 mana 2 3. It has Magnetic, Echo, and Death Hunter. Summon 2 1 1 Microbots, and it's a mech. So, like, I think this is a, quite a strong card. But, like, what kind of rings the alarm bells for me is the fact that Warrior got, like, Dr. Boo, most notably, didn't get touched by the nerfs. Yep. And we, as we will see as we discuss late, later on, the two Warrior cards that got a buff are also mechs. So, like, in, saying, in essence, it looks like Dr. Boom actually got a pretty, like, got a bit of a buff. Yeah. And I mean, like, the fact that this effect stacks means, you know, get, like, getting this off, like, uh, Omega Assembly or... Uh, Delivery Drone. Delivery Drone is going to feel really bad to play against, right? Like, yeah. your opponent, like, the Warrior, let's say, was running out of resources, all of a sudden, uh, snip, snap, snip, snap, snip, snap, and... They've yeah, got a board, like they've got like in fight back, right? Yeah, I mean Omega assembly into like Snip Snap and a bunch of and some other stuff, and then they play, you know, the Snip Snap. Uh, even if they just play three Snip Snaps at that point, you know, magnetic yeah. them onto each other, you end up with your opponent having a six nine that summons six one ones, like yeah. that that and that's come out of nowhere. And if they've played Doctor Boom already, that's that that's uh, also a rushing one. Uh, and you can kind of, because the magnetic is so versatile, you can split it up. So maybe you just want a four, six and a two, three as well. Um, or you buff up three little goblin bombs or, you know, yeah. like, I mean, the, so, so we've just been talking about warrior. This also has potential imp implications for like the hunter, the mech hunter. Yeah. Uh, I mean, all of a sudden now it's got more versatility with like the goblin bombs, like I say. Yeah. And it's also got an even stickier board. I mean, that yeah. deck already plays replicating menace. Uh, which is the four mana three one that that uh, is magnetic with death rattle summon three one one microbots and arguably this is better because it gives the health buff um, and because it has magnetic so it's even more versatile later in the game a and you know getting more uh, kind of microbot generators means you've got more things that you can stick your um, uh missile launches and um war gears and that too so that you can really connect to the face for a lot which is kind of what yeah. that warrior deck likes doing you mean a hunter deck sorry hunter deck yeah what that and um, then also as as, as uh, someone on twitter pointed out uh i, I amusingly i think the, the guy who tweeted about it was the guy the the one guy who brought four mechathon decks to like the the prelims <laughs> uh, so obviously uh, really like, likes oh, combos yeah so, and there's a combo with basically turn four, it's Copper Tail... Imposter. Imposter, the four mana, four, four mech, which has stealth. Mm -hmm. Turn five, you play Reckless Experiment, uh, Reckless Experimenter. Yep. Which makes all your death rounds cost three less. And also, at the end of the turn, dies. And basically, you just infinitely pump up your Copper Tail Imposter and, win it, uh, and like kill your opponent in one turn. Yeah. As to I, I... whether this will be the, a good deck, we'll have to see. Yeah, some people are debating whether it works or not. Um, I've seen some people actually testing it, uh, testing out similar scenarios. So obviously, Snip Snap's not in the game, so we don't quite have a card like that. But I've seen people testing out like interactions with Glinda and uh, Mana Reduction, like uh, Mech Warper in Wild, uh, with like some of the okay. magnetic stuff. I also saw somebody that actually managed to get a Glinda. Uh, obviously, they were setting this up with their friend. So they ha they were playing Priest. They had a Glinda on board and a Reckless Experimenter. And they were able to magnetic a um, Replicating Menace on a lot. And it didn't die at the end of the turn as well, interestingly. 
Oh, wow. So what that means is you can make like a massive, uh, you know, you can buff your copper tail and pasta. And even if like you can't actually get in all the actions to get all the buffs. So depending on the animation for Snip Snap, it, yeah, that could actually really be the... Like, it might be like a 20 second animation. Yeah, that could be the, the limiting factors to how many times you can do it in a turn. Uh, it's not exactly a very skillful like uh lethal you know compared to like the apm priest or something like that um because all you have to do is just chuck your buffs repeatedly on your copper tail imposter but even if you don't finish it let's say you end up with like a 20 uh how many would that would need that would require 16 so you would like a 20 30 46 or 36 or something stupid like that whatever a really big copper tail imposter you're still gonna have that on the board like after that turn because it's not gonna die because of the way the magnetic and reckless experiments and stuff interacts so yeah i mean it's a maybe a bit of a mimi combo but a turn five otk combo is like three, and only need three cards yeah and One there's cards like do. dead ringer that um can yeah guaranteed fetch you the snip snap for instance like can tutor the snip snap which is the hardest one to draw theoretically yeah. so, so it's, maybe we we'll have to see right <laughs> yeah uh, and i mean the the priest also has access to zero mana silence so it's pretty hard to get taunts in the way uh, and master spell if this is like later in the game so maybe uh it's gonna be a pretty feels bad man combo to lose to i think when like <laughs> it happens on turn five because you feel like yeah, it's mostly just about whether they drew it or not and you can't yeah it feels very uninteractive right yeah i mean there's a few ways we can interact with the stealth minion like deadly shots and um uh like spider bomb um fireworks tech and stuff like that but or like you know as a minion into brawl if you or like a brawl if you have stuff on the board but most of the time, you're not really going to have a way to interact with it. So, yeah, it's going to feel pretty bad. But overall, I do, I must say, I do really like the design of Snip Snap. I think it's pretty interesting, but it's definitely seemingly mostly a buff to Hunter and um, Warrior, which is weird considering I think those are two of the classes that are benefiting the most from the nerfs as well. Yeah. I'm not uh, sure if you mentioned this, but... Uh you'll get the golden version for logging in yeah and you'll be able to craft the normal version like with us and it will count as being part of the boomsday project expansion without and so it will rotate at the same time yeah you yeah. won't be able to get boomsday packs <laughs> yeah but uh this rise of mechs is going to go live on the 3rd of june so all you need to do is log in uh, between the 3rd of June and the 1st of July. Yeah, 1st of July in order to get your free Snip Snap. Yeah. Uh, free Golden Snip Snap, as you said. Yeah, which is very important. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's have a look at the uh, classes. Do you want to start us off with the Druid changes, Panamonia? Yeah, so, okay, so the, the two cards being changed in Druid, it's Gloop Sprayer and Mulch Muncher. And both those cards, the, their buff is simply being reduced Gloop Sprayer from 8 mana to 7 mana. Mulch Muncher from 10 mana to 9 mana. Yeah. So, whether this these changes massively impact, Gloop Sprayer didn't see a whole lot of play. I'm not sure if the 1 mana reduction is enough for it. I mean, the the one interaction which does potentially give it hope is uh, Dream Path of Florist now makes it cost 0 mana instead of just 1 mana. Yeah, and uh, Juicy Psych Melon is like another way to draw it. Yeah, because uh, we didn't have a lot of seven cost stuff to necessarily draw with Juicy Psych Melon, so um, you know that can help you set up your combos, whatever they are. Um, although a lot of the time, maybe you want to just draw Dream Petal Florist with your Juicy Psych Melon. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, we I think in our original recording of this uh, episode that we messed up, uh, we we discussed like the whether this is possibly something for like mid range decks, but I I just don't really see a mid range Druid being a thing. Yeah, and then Mulch Muncher, I mean, up to now, most of the token druid, like, decks that have floats around didn't really have the super strong tree energy, and I don't think they needed Mulch Muncher. Yeah. Uh, they were basically just killing you, you know, without... So, the one mana reduction, I'm not sure if it's a sort of a big enough buff to, you know, now warrant you actually playing it. I think the token druid decks might just keep doing what they're doing anymore. Yeah, I, I don't think it'll affect them um, 
uh, too much. Uh, so I think that, that one of the biggest um, effects of the mulch muncher change is actually to the conjurer mage, or, or <laughs> conjurer is calling in mage, and specifically the like uh, miracle spell mage list that we've seen recently, because that deck runs sea giants, which is a ten cost minion, and when you play conjurer is calling on that, uh, it gives you the two ten cost minions. So now. There's no chance it's going to give you Mulch Muncher, which is actually arguably a nerf to the deck overall. Uh, because Mulch Muncher, whilst 8 8 stats might not be the best stats for a 10 drop, uh, the rush effect was actually very, very powerful and gave you an out yeah. in certain scenarios. So um, it's a lot harder to get that. Uh, that Well, you can't get the, it from the 10 mana cost um, Conjurer's Calling anymore. You can still get it from the 9 mana cost Conjurer's Calling. Um, so what this means is Astromancer with a full hand where, you know, Astromancer is giving you a nine drop is getting a little bit more powerful, but that's a harder kind of goal to achieve than playing a sea giants and conjurer is calling it when often your sea giants can just be reduced, uh, by, you know, having minions on the board. So I think overall a slight nerf to that deck, but it's important to just bear in mind where that changes for the conjurer is calling and, and where you can get mulch muncher. Okay, so let's have a look at the uh, Hunter changes. So first up, we have Necromechanic. Necromechanic is going down from a 5-cost uh, minion to a 4-cost minion. So as a 4-mana 3-6, it's a, a lot better stats for its cost. Yeah, it's a pretty good stat line. I mean, it's pretty much the same stat line as Hardmost. And, I mean, a 4-mana 3-6 puts it into, like, it's, it's quite... Like sticky, like it's very, it's quite difficult to remove. Yeah. But also, it's one of those cases of if you don't remove it, it's kind of got that like fan draw sort of, I think, stigma to it. It's like you, 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 you scared of what they can, they, they gain to try and do with it if you leave it up, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like the, it, it's like the brand for death rattles, right? The difference yeah. being that brand was really powerful because. Like, you could play stuff after Bran. Necromechanic, you often want to play the stuff first and then play the Necromechanic. So yeah. that's the one thing that's a little bit different there. Uh, but as a four-mana card, like, you can really... Like, in a mag in a deck that has, let's say, mechs and magnetic, um, you can kind of use the, like, magnetic death rattle mechs, right? Like, Snip Snap or um, uh, Bomb. Spider Bomb or, uh, or Mecha Replicating Drew. Menace. Yeah, or Mechorusha, yeah. or Replicating Menace. Like, all these kind of things that can you can play onto other mechs you have on the board uh, when you when and kind of make the... and trigger the Death Rattles immediately because you're actually yeah. killing them off, right? Um, uh, so, a lot of potential with it. Th also, just even as just a 4-drop, yeah. I think it's quite powerful. Uh, Hunter's a bit I lacking in 4-drops right now, so yeah. it, it works quite so, well for those decks. Uh, a former 36 uh, I definitely I think uh, it's just a case of whether like the, the the mech or the death row mech hunters want it if there's space in the deck for it yeah I mean but, I think it, uh, it's also important going forward right because this necro mechanic you know it's obviously very mech themed but it's not strictly only you know gonna help mechs I mean they, we we've spoken a little bit about the mech synergies I think like one of the other really good ones is like Ursatron because you can play Ursatron on three and then play Necromechanic on four and trade off your Ursatron and draw two cards. That's pretty powerful. Um, but there's also like uh, other synergies. I mean, we've seen uh, the Devil's or Egg rotate to wild now, but like if they have any new egg effects or anything like that that's outside of the mechs, uh, we could even see Necromechanic be useful in, in those decks. Uh, okay, and then the next Hunter card, uh, probably a far less impactful one, is uh, Flocks Boom Zooka going down from 8 mana to 7 mana. Uh, I mean, the issue with this is we kind of struggle to see any real synergies with Flocks Boom Zooka at the moment, right? Yeah, I, I mean, there's no decks that were even on the verge of play. Like, there was no deck, like, even on the verge of playing it. I don't even think the 1 mana reduction really makes a difference. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, I mean, it certainly makes it better, but I just, it's a card that requires like a build around strategy and yeah. that build around strategy hasn't really seemed to be there. So I'm not sure that's going to change. Yeah, so I don't think much to be said about that. Yeah, okay. Uh, and then moving on to Mage. Yeah, so Mage, these are, um, so Mage, is the, the first buff is from Unexpected, is unexpected Results. Mm -hmm. uh, going from four mana to three mana, and the second uh, the buff is 
a Lunar's Pocket Galaxy, which has been reduced from 7 mana to 5 mana. So that's a 2 mana reduction, which is, I think, the biggest reduction uh, amongst these buffs. Yeah, yeah. It is the, the biggest in terms of uh, just mana cost. Um, so unexpected results, talking about that first. Uh, and we're now getting two two drops for three mana. I think that's a lot better price. Discount. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're actually getting a discount for you know having to have these random two drops. And we're kind of getting random two drops combined into to one card in a way, you know? So I think it's a lot better right now. I think this is probably... At the moment, if we looked at how the meta looks right now, this would have the most impact on the Conjurer uh, or the Miracle Spell Mage deck. Uh, yeah. Not only because maybe it's a card you even consider putting in the deck, uh, because with Cadgar you can do it on turn 5 now, which is a lot better, uh, but also because it comes uh, into your hand a lot of the time off stuff like Mana Cyclone. You know, So yeah. now it's a lot better spell to get off there. And then lastly, it's another card put into the pool for Magic Trick because it only costs yeah. three mana now. So uh, I, I'm not sure, if, arguably, if that makes Magic Trick a little bit worse mm -hmm. because usually when you were like uh, like Magic Trick, you might know you you wanted something like um, Elemental Invocation uh, or like Ray of or Frost or Ray of Frost or you know it's like a, a, a one mana or two mana. Spell. Yeah. It, it increases That's, the pool uh, for it, which yeah. can sometimes make it worse if you if there's if you want to just get uh, specific things. But if you're looking for just generally powerful cards, adding a an arguably good card to the pool is is better, right? It's better yeah. than getting some of the secrets a lot of the time. So, yeah, um, unexpected results. Uh, that that's good, but I'm I'm not sure we're gonna see it in decks directly yet. Uh, yeah, yeah, it will be interesting. May I mean, maybe your conjure the, the spell mage one. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the one other synergy is with um, cosmic anomaly. Uh, the the minion that the four three with spell damage plus two. You know that affects the unexpected results. And because nice. cosmic anomaly is an elemental, we could technically like double uh, elemental invocation cosmic anomaly. Play that for free, and then play unexpected results with that on three. So we're getting you know three four drops essentially. Which is oh, decent tempo, oh. but eh, a lot of I don't I don't <laughs> think that's any better than what Conjurer Mage is doing right now. I don't think it's better than Conjurer is calling. You know, sure. it's it's just probably not better than playing Halftime Scavenger, which is a four drop with stealth, and then playing Conjurer's Calling on it afterwards. So, sure. I don't I don't think we'll necessarily see a deck around that. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, Luna's Pocket Galaxy. Uh, so this was something that was saw a little bit of play in the Conjurer's um, or in the Spell Mages, kind of towards the the early iterations of that deck. It quickly fell out, uh, you know, as well with like um, Antonidas leaving the deck. Uh, but now, I mean, there's a lot more potential with it just being at five mana. Yeah, five mana means it's a, it's it's a, I mean, due to the the cost reduction. There's a lot more chance for you to do something the same turn as it, right? Yeah. Because before, at seven mana, there was very, very like, there was very little else you could do with it in terms of like, even if you're on turn ten, you can yeah. play it and then play something that costs three mana. Whereas now the options have opened up quite a lot. And it also makes a huge difference how early you play Luna's Pocket Galaxy. This is another card that like I tend to get off uh, Mana Cyclone a lot. And depending on how early or late that is, it can either be a very good card or a really bad card. Like when you are down to maybe five or six cards left in your deck and maybe two or three of them are minions, then getting Luna's Pocket Galaxy is not all that good. Uh, but when you're getting it uh, when you are maybe, you know, played like an early Mana Cyclone on like turn three or four, then, you know, getting this to play on turn five actually seems like it's going to be worth it because you you've got a lot more time to draw all these uh, cheap minions to make a really big impact. And in that yeah. Conjurer's Calling deck in particular, um, even if you're reducing their mana cost to one, uh, when you play them and Conjurer's Calling them, they're still at the full mana cost for the Conjurer's Calling uh, reasons. So it can be pretty powerful there as well. So yeah, I mean, probably something we mostly see off Mana Cyclone again, um, but <laughs> I think both of these are significant buffs to Mana Cyclone. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, and then next up we have Paladin. So this is probably, I think, one of the most powerful, uh, impactful buffs. 
Uh, and that's to Christology, first of all. So Christology uh, used to be two mana, and it's going down to one mana. So that's half off uh, the mana price of uh, Christology, which is pretty big. And Christology was already seeing play in the um, Holy Wrath Paladin decks, because uh, you could draw some more card draw with like Acolyte of Pain, uh, with Novice um, Engineers, uh, with Crystal Smith Kangor. Crystal Smith Kangor, yeah. Yeah. So it seems pretty good. And now at one mana, uh, I think it's not only going to be useful in that deck, even though it doesn't reduce Shivala as much, but that's not really relevant, to be honest. Uh, um, <laughs> I think that now it has use in some other, like maybe more mid-range decks as well. Like particularly with mech synergies, you've got Glowtron that you can add to the pool of cards you can draw. You've also got um, uh, the Bronze Gatekeeper, which are both kind of buffs in a way that you're drawing with it. So even though one attack minions are not that great later in the game, with the magnetic effects, you can stick them on your other mechs and they can still have an impact, even if you're not you know, playing them early. And it gives you a pretty like reasonable turn one when a lot of the times in those decks, your only other turn one play might be the Glowtron, which in some matchups, you'd rather magnetic onto something bigger than play by itself. Yeah, the, the thing though is... Uh... I find the buff a little bit interesting, considering they've just like we, we've just had the whole they've adjust like like they've just done the whole raiding party adjustment of you know to put it more in line with specific to specific tutoring they've wanted to make a bit more expensive, whereas yep. now they've literally gone like exact it is, opposite like there's like basically it is very incon it, it's as inconsistent as the game of thrones the <laughs> series plot because like now minimum 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 cost you're getting is two one drops right yeah like, like well get, like technically no you could get two wisps but okay no. sure but i'm saying majority of the times you so you majority of the time you're getting 50 percent off with, I mean, well, not off, I say, like, value you're drawing. Sure. So, I don't know. Like, I think it could, has a potential to be very powerful. One mana means mm. it's very easy. Like, first of all, pa the Paladins weren't doing much from turn one. Yeah. But also now just slotted it in, obviously, one mana instead of two mana makes it easier to slot in. Yeah, alongside doing something else. Like, yeah. if you Consecration on turn five, oh, you can just play Christology with it, you know. it's yeah. it, As you say, it's a lot more flexible like that. So it's I think that makes a pretty big difference. And I, I, I agree, like, one mana to draw two cards definitely seems like a good deal to me. Yeah. Uh, so, even if those kind of two cards are, mm, let's say, not necessarily the most powerful cards usually, but cards you have to kind of make specific synergies work for. But I think, you know, we've come up with more than enough examples where Christology is drawing you cards that are pretty good. So... I think Christology is, is looking very powerful. Uh, okay, and then the, the other Paladin card they've buffed, uh, a card that had a few people hyped um, when it was released, um, notably like Fino and of course uh, Brian Kibler because he loves these hand buff mechanics, and that's Glowstone Technician uh, going down from a six mana uh, minion to a th uh, five mana minion. So I think this makes a big difference once again, you know, uh, because... Now, you're, you're, it's a lot less of a, a tempo loss to play it. You know, three, four stats for five um, is a lot less bad than uh, three, four stats for six, right? Yeah. I like, yeah, it's less bad. I still don't think it, like, we'll have to see if it's actually good. Yeah. I mean, maybe if you're playing Christologies, right? Like, imagine your early turns are Christologies. Uh, like you play two of them into like glowstone technician then you're getting quite a lot of cards buffed because your christology is drawing like you know two smaller minions that are now getting plus two plus two like these two buffs actually kind of work together um you're really not uh, not sold i'm not sold i i don't know i think glowstone technician is looking a lot like more reasonable like maybe one of the best hand buff cards we've seen um I'm but sorry, hand... I still don't know if that's good enough, is my, my point. Yeah, hand buff is a mechanic that has been very underwhelming. So I yeah. think that's that's the biggest uh, asterisk next to Glowstone Technician here. Uh, okay, so moving on to Priest. So Priest got, uh, I think, two sort of... Also, uh, I mean, two Priest spells. 
Yeah. Uh, we see extra arms being reduced from 3 mana to 2 mana and clone device from 2 mana to 1 mana. So extra arms, I would also think that the card more arms is also being reduced to 2. I haven't checked yet. Yeah, I haven't but seen any intuit feedback. Intuitively, that's kind of what would tell me. And for me, this like this might make Priest a lot more relevant in terms of, I mean, maybe now you play a more you know mid rangey like in a fire version because I mean turn one you can play you know North Shire turn two you play this buff yeah you know it's a lot more I mean two mana for plus two plus two is pretty decent yeah with the extra plus two plus two spell uh, yeah I mean this is kind of like uh, the first uh, version that we saw of twin spell. And I think, yeah. you know, the way they costed it at first, they looked at it like, ah, uh, you're paying the extra mana because you get this extra card back in your hand. But if we compare it to the twin spells we see now, you're basically paying a fair mana price for the card and then getting a, a second card, a second version of that card, like just as a bonus in a way, you know? Yeah. Like what we see for like Forest Aid or Ray of Frost, which are the most commonly played twin spells, they're about fair for their mana cost anyway, uh, even yeah. if you ignored the twin spell part. Uh, yeah, and I think so, that's kind of what they were juggling. I think that's probably what like the devs were kind of playing around with. Yeah. Because the problem is, if, if you overcost it too much to compensate for the twin spell, it then just is bad, right? It, it sees yeah. zero play. So the only like twin spells that see play are the ones that, like you say, without without minus take away the twin spell and the card's still decent. Yeah, I mean. I think even the the hunter one, one mana for one damage is like roughly what you expect. A little undervalued compared to like arcane shot, I suppose, which is one mana for two damage. Or what's it, um, on the hunt? Sure, or on the hunt, which gives you the one one. So yeah, I mean that's probably a good example where it's a little bit undervalued compared to the other cards. Um, but anyway, uh, getting back to extra arms, I mean, as you mentioned, there's a lot more curve possibility. You know, the idea that priests can like buff their stuff and then heal it has, has always been like a kind of priest mid-range strategy that's always been more of an arena thing than a standard thing. But maybe with this, priest can play more of a mid-rangey strategy. Uh, obviously, there's the, the Northshire Cleric um, uh, synergy you talked about. And then there's also like test subject on one into extra arms, you know. Uh, yeah. Having a 2-4 on turn 2 that can attack immediately is, is pretty decent, and it gives you back the extra arms buff as well. So maybe then, worth considering. The clone device is like one mana. I mean, it's the synergies now potentially in like your the Nomi Miracle Priest, uh, you know, another cheap spell that yeah. also gives you the information. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's a bit more like Mind Vision now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's kind of like... This one is where they kind of align the cost better, right? Yeah, this is telling you a card that's in your opponent's deck, which means you know at least that one is not in their hand. I mean, if it's well, a legendary... Three, well, yeah, yeah, no, no. But well, I mean, like, what I mean is, like, yes, for each of those cards, you know this about that one copy of that card is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, Whereas yeah. if it's a legendary, yeah. obviously, they only have one copy. If it's another card, like, maybe they've played one copy and you see the other one. So it gives you some information about three, yeah. you know, three cards um which you can know are, are in their deck so there is some information there um but honestly we've seen this kind of like information thing as people something some something people talk about a lot and it's never really been good i mean there's the older cards you talked about like you know thoughts deal and mind vision but then we've also seen like camellias a card that got a lot of hype fell flat madame lazul yeah. another card that gives information pretty much fell flat i just i don't really see cloning device being something that I want to play. Like, Except I'm spending one mana one to get one spell. of... That's what I'm saying. Like, I think maybe, like, your Nomi Priest, right? Like, like yeah. cycle. Like, it, it's discovers plus cycles. I think that's the appeal. Not yeah. necessarily the actual effect. It's a one mana spell that can cycle. Result. Yeah. The problem is, in that deck, that um, you have so many zero-cost spells that one mana seems expensive. Sure. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, so, yeah. I, I'm not sure cloning... Um, device will find any new home but it seems a lot more in line for what you should expect it to cost actually and then moving uh, on to your favorite class yeah moving on to rogue so let's see if they can make up for those rogue nerfs and we're going to be starting off with uh pogo hopper so pogo hopper is down from two mana to one mana so another half price off uh for mana costs here i mean a one mana one one mech um seems you know kind of okay there's not that much magnetic stuff that rogue does but you know, Snip Snap is some addition to it at least. 
So having a, an extra mech that you can make um, as a magnetic target is reasonable. And then now the second pogo hopper is a one mana three three, which seems a lot more reasonable, right? Like the first one, you have to play a arguably undervalued card as a one mana one one, and then the second one, you get that buff immediately. Uh, it so also makes it, sorry. It also makes pogo hopper easier to combo with like other yeah. cards. So to activate your combo cards like SI seven agents, etc., and also to combo with like cards that can help the pogo hopper, like um, Spirit of the Shark or even like the Togwaggle Scheme plus uh, Tack. Uh, combo synergy that we saw in some of the the early specialist decks. Yeah, so I think the question now is if a like a po a dedicated poker hop deck becomes a thing, or if it will still remain sort of sideboard uh, more a more efficient sideboard option, like you say with you know we sideboarding pogo two pogo hoppers and uh, like two schemes and a shadow step or something like that. Yeah, I mean, people have always been enjoying playing Pogo Hopper. I mean, it's been a pretty hyped card since it was, like, announced and people were yeah. playing with it since it's been released, right? So this is definitely going to see a new wave of people playing Pogo Hopper. Whether, as you say, that actually becomes a solid kind of rogue archetype it remains to be seen. I think there's enough other kind of battle cries and synergies with, like, Spirit of the Shark, for instance, that we don't... We're not forced to really play Pogo Hopper, but I think... As you say, specialist might be where Pogo Hopper shines in the in the sideboards and um, and those you know the secondary and tertiary decks. Yeah. Uh, and then the next card is Violet Haze, going down from three mana to two mana. Uh, so this is a card that adds two random death rattle cards to your hand. Uh, we're just going to remind you because Violet Haze is a card that uh, you barely ever see. The only time I actually ever see this is off Ethereal Lackey. So as weird as this is, it's a buff to Ethereal Lackey. Um, in fact, uh, Pogo Hopper going from two mana to one mana is also a buff to um, Faceless Lackey because you can oh, know yeah, yeah. that's one less one one you can get off the oh, yeah, that's true as well. Off yeah, the I Faceless Lackey. That. Yeah, I, re I remembered that when I was playing earlier today before the. Well, actually, I suppose I was it was before the nerfs anyway. But I played a Faceless Lackey and got a Pogo Hopper, and I was like, ah, that's not gonna happen again. <laughs> that might be the last time I ever get that. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it's a little bit of a... So so the, these cards actually both affect lackeys a little bit, um, which is, you know... I mean, lackeys are taking a little bit of a nerf with the miscreant change, so... Uh, but the lackeys themselves are still remaining powerful across other classes, and in Rogue, this makes them uh, better as well, because, you know, Violet Haze is now, the, now a cheaper spell that you can discover. And I suppose that's true for lackeys in all the other classes as well, um, where, where they've seen, you know, spells reduced at least. And where they're Ultimately, relevant. though, I still don't think it's great. I mean, yeah. two random death rattles. There are a lot of bad death rattles. A lot of garbage death rattles. So yeah, but this does card. this does kind of bring it in line with cards we see, like Astral Rift, the mage one that adds sure. two random minions to your hand. So it's not I, a card. I think that's good. This, like 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 you say, the only time you're gonna see hmm. this is off like is gonna be off the discover effects. It's gonna be off the lackeys. I don't think you're ever running this in your deck. Yeah, look, even, I, even I, I death, agree. Even a death rattle rogue deck won't want this. No, you, you want much more specific death rattle synergies in in any kind of death yeah. rattle rogue deck because there you're trying to make like shadow blade and or not shadow blade, um, necrium blade, kind of work yeah. and and violet haze is not really going to help with this. It does bring it in line with the prep nerf, uh, but probably not really a relevant thing either. Yeah. Okay, so then moving on to shaman. Yeah, the shaman, they. Uh, they got two two buffs, or I mean, obviously the Stormbringer got reduced from seven mana to six mana, and Thunderhead got buffed from a four mana three five to a four mana three six. Now Stormbringer was a bit of a meme card. I mean, uh, Deb, you remember playing it in uh, your uh, aggro token shaman? Uh, yeah. Stuff. And I remember <laughs> playing it a couple times in the deck. I. In the last game, I just had on the crazy game I had on ladder before this, uh, but that was getting it off of Blink Foxes against the Shaman. Uh, so you know, I think I actually just realizing that a lot of these buffs that are making cards better are making Rogue's Thief Pool better. <laughs> As a weird side note. Yeah. So six mana. It's, it's not a card that saw any actual playing decks. I mean, it's mainly through like discovery effects that you see it, and it sometimes good. So I'm not sure if the mm. I mean, this is obviously a slight buff to all those, 
but realistically, I don't. I still. I'm not sure. Is a to, is a token shaman deck a possibility? I mean, look, we got Soul of the Forest that helps give you more minions on the board for synergy. But this is kind of like a third Bloodlust in a way, or you know, maybe in spe in some specialist decks you want this instead of Bloodlust as in like your secondary or something, like where you need more okay. value. Um, okay, sure. it's also relevant coming off Hagatha, uh, which is actually some of the times you see it. And the fact that you can fit in an extra one drop is maybe somewhat relevant as well. Oh, sure. in, in the token yeah. decks, you're playing probably quite a few one drops, especially if it's like Murloc, um, Shaman, or even just like with the, the lackeys with the, um, the, the Murloc lackey dude that gives lackeys. I totally forgot his name now. Um, but being able to fit in the extra one drop before you do it, that means one extra legendary, which increases your yeah. chance of, of not having three garbage legendaries, um, <laughs> like I have had. Uh, so I think the, it's a pretty relevant buff to Stormbringer. Uh, I just not hundred percent sure it's good enough for us to put Stormbringer in our decks. Well, I mean, look at this way, like it, uh, with Thunderhead, you can like do Thunderhead, play like Zap, Beacon, uh, I mean like... Beacon Lightning, Zapped, and then Stormbring in the same turn. Sure, you right. can get a board of like seven uh, legendaries with just... Well, I mean, we're looking at... Uh, it, so uh, you obviously... Be, you could, Beacon you Lightning is going to kill your once. stuff. Yeah. So you can only do it well, I, I was thinking like just two Zaps. Yeah, two Zaps. So two Zaps is like already... Um, five minions. Five minions with the Thunderhead. So we can get like... Five there. Um, five legendary, which I mean is pretty decent. So yeah, but I that's, know, that's ten mana. Ten mana for five legendaries doesn't seem like a good deal anymore. And four cards. That yeah. the more I kind of go over the terms of that con that deal, I'm le the less I'm happy with it. Sure. Uh, but yeah, maybe maybe Stormbringer in some kind of token deck. But more relevant for the token decks is going to be Thunderhead. Um, yeah. Yeah, so and the Thunderhead was a card that I thought was really good to begin with. Yeah, it, it just didn't it just didn't have a home. But like now, nah, four mana three six once again, like we like, like we spoke with earlier, just that extra stick like that resilience is gonna I think it make it really really good. Yeah, and Thunderhead is one of those cards that like if it sticks on the board, you get to really punish your opponent for it, right? Like Necromechanic we spoke about earlier, um, if it sticks on the board, it might be a bit slow to punish your opponent. You know, Houndmaster Shaw is immediate to punish your opponent, like right after, because you can play some minion that will have Rush. Um, whereas uh, Thunderhead is also a little bit like that, because you can immediately play your Overload spells and immediately get those um, Rushing Sparks to kind of, uh, kind of further press your advantage on board. So I think, you know, in terms of the, the two 4-mana 3-6s, or the two minions that, got, uh, that are now 4-mana 3-6s, I think the Thunderhead one might be more significant, uh, because I think this is really one of the cards that's going to push forward these kind of token sh uh, Shaman decks. You know, this and the, the Murloc package, but they're not even necessarily, um, uh, like, uh, mutually exclusive. You know, you can have a couple cheap removals uh, that have Overload that can combine with Thunderhead as well as having some of the, the Murloc stuff, maybe. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, so anything you want to add on Thunderhead? No, I just think, uh, you know, there's even more incentive to play it now. Yeah. Uh, okay, and then next up we have Warlock. Uh, we have Spirit Bomb going from 2 mana to 1 mana. Uh, and we have Dr. Morrigan going from 8 mana to 6 mana. So let's start off with Spirit Bomb. Um, one of the, the issues with this card, right, is that it's kind of moving in line with damage to mana cost ratio of Soulfire uh, right now, but with a different kind of added cost, right? Spirit Bomb is dealing the damage to you. Uh, and can only hit minions. Soulfire can hit face, uh, but is making you discard a card. So I think that, you know, these are two cards that give you very different options for different decks, right? So, so sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just saying Spirit Bomb and Soulfire are kind yeah. of two, two similar cards in a way that are giving you different options for different decks, right? Yeah. Um, the thing is, so the Spirit Bomb nerf, I mean buff, I think it makes the card objectively very good. But it's now it's just a question of if there's a deck that find that, that that like will want it. 
because con slower like control warlocks aren't really a thing right now. The only really viable warlock deck is Zoo, and I, I I think you mentioned I don't think Spirit Bomb really fits into that plan. You'd rather still play Soulfire. Yeah. So. Uh, so yeah, uh, good card needs a home. <laughs> yeah, I mean. It Maybe there could be a control lock that can make use of this, but you, you do need to be able to kind of regain that health. And that's a slight issue with the control warlocks now. Another issue was that they were suffering against like control um, warriors because they would kind of always lose the, the fatigue battle um, because they obviously draw more cards themselves and then they lose because they don't necessarily, well, they don't have a, they weren't necessarily playing like the recur Elysiana thing. So. Now, maybe Control Warlock can be a bit better, but yeah, Spirit Bomb is going to struggle for a home, I think. Uh, and then Dr. Morrigan, another card that didn't really have any real home, right? Yeah, Dr. Morrigan, uh, it's like similar to Cairn, but not in the fact that you need to build your deck so specifically. And I just don't think it's good enough like even six mana five five is better than obviously an eight mana five five but in terms of what you need to pull i think it's too restricting on your deck in terms of your your, your deck construction yeah i mean if we compare it to something like um uh possessed lackey uh which is also something that kind of when it died pulled something from your deck morrigan obviously puts morrigan herself back into the deck which is a difference there and obviously has a better stat line but the difference is as you say it's a lot more restrictive on your deck right because morrigan can pull any minion from your deck whereas possessed lackey was pulling only demons so you could put other cheap minions in and then just expensive demons or you know impactful demons like we saw whereas uh, Morrigan, it's it's affecting all the minions, so you really have to have probably a, a high concentration of spells, and then just a few more uh, expensive kind of good minions or minions that are you know good to get off Doctor Morrigan. So I think the card offers a lot of potential, um, but it's gonna require a very new deck archetype to work, right? Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe it's a thing. I mean, is it? There's no real synergies with Mechathun, is there? Uh, because uh, I mean, we'll, we'll just put a, something back in your deck, so there's no real... I'm just trying to think, there's no current, there's no real uh, easy, like, abusable... Well, theoretically, if Mechathun is the last card in your deck, uh, you can Morrigan to pull out the Mechathun and then, like, tap to draw the Morrigan and soul fire the Morrigan away, but I don't see how that's helping you know, us. Uh, yeah, it feels uh, that's not really helping us at all. Yeah. Um, because I don't know how we're killing the Mechathun there. So I'm not really sure it, it helps there. Um, it could help with uh, some um, some other like more mid-rangey strats as well. Where, you know, just having a 6 mana 5-5 five, five that kind of pulls like any randomish card from your deck might be reasonable. I mean, what do you have to get from a 6 mana 5-5 five, five for it to be okay? Like, is 3-3 three, three stats okay? Oh, like three, three. I mean, if you look at it objectively, sure, three mana, three, three stats would be is like. But at, in terms of the fact that you play this in turn six, you probably want at least a five, five or better. You think so? You know? I, I, I like, think. I think even if you got like a four, four, it might be okay. I think it would. But I just be think reasonable. it's a bit too low impact. Remember, turn six. I think it's quite low impact to just get a four, four. Yeah, but I mean, That's so is Ken, high, right? Think. Like the idea in yeah, a mid range deck with two, six, four, fives. Yeah, but. I mean, the idea in a mid-range deck with a card like this is that it protects you from like board clears and stuff. You sure, know, you're not I like mean, you're not like playing it and kill it and like sacking it right away necessarily. But still, I don't know. The fact that it's from your deck means you still want early stuff in your deck. You know, it's yeah, not like Kane in the fact that you play in a six mana four five and you guarantee the four five. Yeah. Like this, are you really building your deck so that you're not running anything like that's less than a 3-3. Three, three. Like, yeah. That's kind of what your question is, right? Yeah, that is the big issue. Uh, okay, so moving on to the final class that's getting buffs, uh, and that is Warrior. Uh, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about these Warrior cards that are changing. So, I mean, I think basically, in terms of talking about them, we we'll probably sort of talked about them together. Yeah. But basically, the buff is Security Rovers going from a 6 mana 2-5 to a 6 mana 2-6, and Beryllium Nullifier is going from a 7 mana 3-8 the uh, seven mana four eight 
And so, individually, both these cards never saw... I don't think they've ever seen actual play in the in decks, in Warrior yeah. decks. But what why they are relevant and why this is quite important is because they've quite often you see them off Doctor uh you see them off Omega Assembly or uh, Delivery Drone, uh, which yeah. is one of Doctor Boom's hero powers. And this becomes I think I mean so basically I think this is like an indirect buff to Doctor Boom. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, and I mean Security Rover was actually one of the a lot of the times one of the better ones you could discover off the the, the delivery drone, right? Because yeah. it was like in the case where uh, Security Rover has rush plus all the mechs it's summoning have rush, it can be very impactful. And now it's got one extra health with me, which means you know sometimes you're just getting one extra two three. So one health makes yeah. a big difference to Security Rover. Yeah, and I mean Barium Nullifier, the fact that it's our four attack means obviously offensively it's it's much better yeah you know it can deal more obviously deal more damage but also like even on defense it's more useful yeah. so all around these are of all the buffs these are the only ones i'm sort of a bit wary of because it's essentially indirectly buffing uh mech i mean wa uh, wa warrior and yeah like dr I boom i feel I'm like worried about that i feel like their logic here is these cards aren't played so let's buff them but the thing is, like as you as we're kind of talking about, they do have impacts, even though they're not directly played in uh, any decks. So I feel like they're trying to make them like playable. But Warrior actually has so many good cards right now that I don't see these still being like I still don't see these being playable. No, for sure. Like I, I, I don't think you my majority of them. I don't think you ever play these in your actual deck. But like if you just if you get them off a of Mega Assembly or you discover Delivery Drone, you're probably still going to be quite happy. I think. Yep. Definitely. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's that's all uh, 18 buffs that we have uh, to discuss. Um, overall, is there, is there any one that sticks out to you that you're, you're most excited about or think is most powerful? Um, For me, it's, it's probably Thunderhead. It's probably Thunderhead and Christology. I think I like the, the standouts and maybe Necromechanic, but... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I was a big fan of Thunderhead. I think you'll remember, like, when we were doing set reviews and stuff for Boomsday Project. Um, like, I, I built a couple decks with Thunderhead, and I, I really enjoyed playing Thunderhead in the early days of um, Boomsday Project, testing out, like, uh, Token Shaman decks, you know, like you were mentioning with the Stormbringer shenanigans. Uh, but that was just to see what that card was like. Whereas Thunderhead, I thought, was really the crux of the deck. And so it's seeing a buff is pretty good. But I, I think Christology is by far the most powerful of the buffs. I think it's going to take Paladin from what is currently a fairly uh, fringe class to a class that could be um, really good. So I think Christology is a huge buff. Like it's, it's, and it seems so inconsistent because they, they nerf Raiding Party because it draws you specific cards and then buff Christology, as you mentioned. Yeah, and that's yeah. So, I it's, mean, it's that's, like, that's Blizzard, right? Yeah. It's Blizzard and uh, Dan and Dave's character writing in Game of Thrones. That, that's the two things that uh, do that kind of inconsistency. Uh, but yeah, enough uh, slamming of uh, Dan and Dave. Because uh, I, I know Pandemonia doesn't really want to talk about that. Because you, you, don't, you don't care about Game of Thrones. <laughs> nope, not at all. Not in the slightest. Uh, okay, so moving on then. We also had the... Grandmasters first week uh, of play this last weekend. Um, oh, yeah. Before I think before you do that, uh, the 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 side part of the buffs will be the arena season as well, right? Oh yes, yes, true. Uh, the arena season is changing. Um, so you know, forgot about it because neither of us really play much arena. I don't think. Um, yeah. But the arena season is going to be changing when the buffs come on the third of June. So now the arena um, sets that are, are going to be live in arena are going to be classic, basic, uh, Goblins vs. Gnomes, Grand Tournament, Karazhan, Boomsday Project, and Rise of Shadows. So the big takeaway there is a lot of mechs. You know, we're getting Mech Warper plus Magnetic stuff in the same, oh uh, in the same arena dumb. season, right? Yeah. yeah, so mechs are going to be very prevalent. Classes that are good at mechs are going to be good. Um, yeah, so... I mean, the big difference is in, in, in Arena, there's no Dr. Boom because they kind of remove the hero cards. So that that Shattered. makes Warrior a little bit more reasonable in terms of mechs. But yeah. 
that that's that could be quite interesting for for any mech lovers it's going to be a good time to to jump into the arena uh, but yeah, okay, back on to the, the Grandmasters topic. Uh, so Grandmasters week one happened this last weekend. Uh, we saw quite a few matches uh, for, from each region. Um, I think 16 matches in total from each region. Um, we saw uh, the, the regions had very different distributions. So the way Grandmasters works is for each different like week, each different weekend, they resubmit new decks. Um, so you kind of... You're in general playing two opponents um, in a weekend, uh, so that means that it, you you can't just target a single opponent. You know, you kind of want to build your you kind of want to pick a deck that's going to work against a wider field. I would say, but we might see more targeting as we go along in the grandmasters and patterns start to establish for what decks which players like. Um, yeah. We'll we'll see if that becomes a thing. But I think the ability to target kind of also makes this idea of like a class specialist a lot worse, right? In in Grandmasters, because like if I'm known for playing a class and my opponent knows they're playing me, then they can just easily target my class, right? That that seems a bit weird. Yeah, I mean, I've I've never really bought into that whole narrative, like, oh, uh, you know, you're gonna be a specialist. I mean, because realistically, I think to be good and at a competitive level. You still need to be pretty competent with every class, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, to understand, like it's like like I, you know, I always say, to understand what a deck can do against you, it's always good to be in their shoes to know what the deck can do. Yeah, exactly. It's good to have actually experience playing that deck as well. It, it makes hand reading much easier and all of that. Um, anyway, so in the different regions, we saw a lot of rogue in Asia Pacific. Um, that was kind of the dominant class in uh, the Americas. We saw a lot of warrior. That was definitely the most dominant class with some really long series and a lot of those streams going quite over in terms of length because of warrior mirrors, the Americas oh, ones in yeah. particular. Uh, and then in Europe, we had more of a mix with probably Europe having the most amount of majors, which to me just seems like Europe was the region most on top of the meta, honestly, uh, because uh, like the majors seemed... Major just seemed like the power, most powerful class right now, and and it performed exceptionally well in Grandmasters. Um, so yeah, I, I think it was it was pretty interesting. I, the the website that we mentioned in the last uh, Magma Rages is is definitely a helpful tool for following along with what's happening, and even now for going back if you want to watch specific vods um, to see specific matchups. I think it's a good. In that way, it can also be a good learning tool to see how pros play specific matchups, you know. If you're struggling with the Warrior Mirror, you can go back and watch some of the Warrior Mirrors uh, and, oh, you know, God. sit oh. down for two hours and uh, learn how <laughs> yeah, to play Yeah, hopefully them. you don't, like, fall asleep while watching this. There were some relatively exciting Warrior Mirrors. Um, uh, there was a lot of Bomb Warrior as well, um, which, you know, can at least lead to some uh, edge-of-the-seat nonsense where there, there might be a bomb or two to... To do some silly things. Or three or four. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the the one other thing I just want to mention on esports is this weekend I'm going to be uh, casting and hosting some of the EU um, rival uh, EU house rivals, rival rivalries, rivalries, EU house rivalries. Uh, Bemi's going to be angry at me for butchering the name. Um, but yeah, that's basically a team tournament that, um, um, uh, that, uh, that Bemi has been running uh, under his like uh, organization for a while, uh, and it, it's pretty cool. Um, last like the last time I was involved, uh, not just last weekend, but the weekend before, we we got to kind of cast one of the one of Hunter Ace's games when he was playing with Nordevent after just coming back from Worlds, which is pretty cool. There's a lot of top players in a lot of those teams, and it's really interesting to see how the the teams build their lineups because for that we get to see some uh, good old four pick one band conquest again. Uh, in, a, ah. in a team tournament so it's nice to see how the conquest meta looks uh, in comparison to the specialist meta as well yeah um, so yeah make sure you, you come and uh, check that out if you want to find out when we're going live with that you can check my uh, Twitter and to find out links for when that's live um, but yeah anything else you want to add Pandemonia before we sign off for this episode no, I think we've, we've spoke, uh, spoken a lot about the, the I'm just really excited it's something that, you know they've never done before I just going forward. I think this is it's it's really refreshing to see them actually starting to pay attention to what 
you know people want yeah i mean this is like buffing cards has been something that's been requested since even before hearthstone really existed right like it was one of the big things talked about in terms of like a, a benefit for digital card games is that you can kind of buff and, and nerf the cards and we've obviously seen nerfs for a long time but these are some of the the biggest kind of round of buffs we we've seen and pretty much the first buffs that have any impact on standard at least um yeah. So, yeah, you know, big shout outs and, and props to the, the Hearthstone, you know, dev team and balance team for, for these changes. Uh, they're going to really do a, go a long way to kind of shaking up the meta midway through an expansion without have, us having to rely on nerfs as well. Uh, and I think buffs, I, I imagine they're going to feel a lot better than nerfs um, because it's not like killing the decks that you might enjoy playing. Uh, it's actually like bringing new archetypes into the meta, you know? So even if you just want to play one deck that is unaffected by the buffs, you get to play against some different new stuff and, and everybody usually enjoys that, right? So yeah. I think it's a, it's a very positive approach and it's important that we kind of give the, the developers feedback on, on these things to say that we are actually enjoying this, right? Because it's something they've spoken about a lot that feedback is important. And I mean, uh, like Reddit is a great place to give feedback as well as obviously the, the official blizzard forums um i just went and tagged a bunch of them on twitter and said like yeah these are good changes i don't know if anyone if any relevant people will ever read that but you know it's at least um indicating in some way that that we were kind of a fan of these changes and giving that feedback is very important um to to kind of encourage them to do it again yeah exactly uh, okay, so yeah, that's all we have for this episode. Uh, if you want to find us on Twitter, you can find Pandemonia at PandemoniaZA. Uh, you can find myself at Dib underscore gaming. Uh, and you can also find me uh, Dib underscore gaming on Twitch where we're often streaming or where I'm often streaming and uh, sometimes Pandemonia comes and joins <laughs> for some, some co-ops like that insane game we had before the stream. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and also make sure you like and subscribe on YouTube, all of that good stuff. Thanks, everyone, for, for all the support. Uh, comments are always also appreciated on the video. Let us know what you think about the nerfs and the buffs. Uh, what are your most powerful or which of the buffs you think are going to be most impactful? You know, maybe share any lists. Uh, maybe we'll do some some videos uh, on theory crafting for some of these um, buffs if that's something that's in demand. You know, if that's something you want to see, you can also let me know in the in the comments down below. Uh, so yeah, thanks everyone uh, from us. Cheerio. Cheerio.